Prince Philip is one of the British monarchy's most controversial figures. Decidedly old school and occasionally inappropriate. <laughs> yes, he is brusque and he can be abrupt. And yes, he sometimes says some things which are totally out of order. A stark contrast to the modern younger royal family. But before he joined the House of Windsor, Philip's life was an epic tale of war. Several people were executed, and Prince Philip's father looked very likely to suffer the same fate. Illness and tragedy. Philip's mother was clearly falling into a state of mental decline. Abandonment. His father was living with a mistress in Monte Carlo. And heroism. Prince Philip probably saved hundreds of lives on his ship by his very, very swift action. It's a life that dashes from the war-torn Mediterranean. A royal family running for their lives, pretty much as dramatic as you can get. To the streets of Paris and the school halls of Nazi Germany. Well, he would have been exposed to all of the doctrine that was being pumped out by the Nazis at that time. How did this royal survivor come through such extraordinary times? Having such a troubled childhood, it's given the backbone to him to put up with anything. And could Philip's experiences before joining the House of Windsor explain his later life of service and devotion? There was nothing of a home life for him. There are some people who have difficult home lives who it drives to work harder and to succeed. After 50 years of experience, I find there's a great temptation to give advice. Turkey in 1922. The Greek army is invading its old enemy in a brutal war. One of the army's leading figures is the Greek prince, Andrea, who has recently become father to baby Philip. Prince Philip's father was a major general in the Greek army who were invading part of Turkey, Anatolia, but there was a huge military setback and, and the, the Greek forces had to flee to the coast. Following the army's humiliating retreat from Turkey, the pro-monarchy Greek government is overthrown and its leaders are held responsible for the disaster. In the aftermath of this coup, several of the people were court-martialed and executed, including a former prime minister, a former foreign minister, um, several of the sort of top generals. And when the execution was carried out, they all stood incredibly bravely and stared at the firing squad. Prince Philip's father... ...for Philip, um, suddenly, uh, really the rug is pulled beneath uh, his family's feet. Philip's father's life is only spared by the court when his cousin, the British king, George V, intervenes. Somewhat surreptitiously, I think, George V was, was very instrumental in organising um, the, the escape from Greece of uh, his, his cousins, including Philip, a babe in arms, who was taken onto this, uh, this ship. With, of course, there was no cot, no crib for him, and so the sailors engineered uh, a cot for him out of old fruit crates. It is a dramatic start in life for Prince Philip. Born Philippos Andreou in Corfu just 18 months earlier in June 1921. He was born on the dining room table, in fact, of a beautiful villa in Corfu called Mont Repos. Uh, and he was born on the dining room table because the surgeon thought that was the best place for Alice to give birth. Um, and by all accounts, he was a, a very much wanted and loved young son. Philip's mother, Alice, is a princess of the German House of Battenberg with illustrious British ancestral roots. Prince Philip's mother was Princess Alice of Battenberg and she was born in 1885 in the presence of her great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, in Windsor Castle. Philip is the great-great-grandson of Queen Victoria. His parents have royal lineage right back through to the British royal family, but also to the Greek and uh, Danish thrones. He was very, very well connected. Um, and by the time he was born, his relations were on practically every throne throughout Europe. Philip's father, Prince Andrea of Greece, is the brother of the Greek king and a full-time soldier. The wars between Greece and Turkey have actually been going on for many, many years. And the royal family and Prince Andrea were very much placed into senior positions in the military. 
A military coup following the latest defeat forces the Greek royal family into exile. Philip's family, including his four elder sisters, have to flee their homeland. This really was as pretty much as dramatic as you can get. Um, and of course, this is now, uh, you know, a royal family really uh, running for their lives. They were able to smuggle some jewellery in their clothes and some money, but very little. It's quite a dramatic start to his life. He has no recollection of the family fleeing in, in 1922, but it had enormous consequences and, and led to him being a bit of a wandering boy. Despite their royal connections, when the family flees Corfu with baby Philip, they have... They are now uh, really looking for refuge. This is the beginning, I suppose, of quite a nomadic existence for Prince Philip. They settled in the home of one of his aunts and uncles um, at Saint-Cloud in, in Paris. They basically gave the exiled family a house in which to live and if they needed it, they, they would help them financially. Their life in Paris was fairly stable, but of course they were dependent on charity, basically, and I don't think anybody really likes that very much. And the other point is, of course, that as members of the royal family, they felt themselves dispossessed and, in a sense, pointless. They didn't have anything that they could really do. But Philip's life in Paris is happy and stable, surrounded by his loving family. I think these early years of Philip's life were perhaps the happiest of his childhood because it was relatively settled for those years in Paris. And his father, Andrea, endured him. His sisters recalled how the big gales of laughter when Philip and his father were, were larking around. He was able to be educated. His relatives paid for him to have a, a good education. He was multilingual. He speaks, as a result, fluent French as well as German. But when Philip is eight years old, his happy family life in Paris begins to break down. Philip's mother, Alice, was clearly very fragile in her emotional, psychological health. And there's every sense that the kind of trauma of the events in Greece and their hasty departure um, really did put her under psychological strain. No one really knows whether she suffered from bipolar disorder or whether she was, in fact, paranoid schizophrenic. Alice felt she communicated with the spiritual world. She took to lying on the floor for great periods of time, waiting for the spirits to, to tell her what she should be doing. Philip's father, Prince Andrea, has his own struggles with life in exile. I think that Andrea is perhaps unfulfilled because he's, he's had life as a, as a Greek royal, and then he's a major general in the army, and then suddenly he's an exile. And I, I think a middle-aged prince without a role, that's difficult. Alice's growing mental instability had a profound effect on her marriage, which maybe had never been that strong, but certainly in, in view of her eccentricities and her, her mental breakdown, Andrea spent less and less time with the family. Alice's family takes the decision that she needs urgent help. One Easter holidays, the family had gone to stay with some relations in Germany, and Alice's mother, organized for psychiatric doctors sort of into the car and, and, and driven off to a, a secure sanatorium. As a result, his father then seemed to somewhat abandon the family. Bear in mind, his sisters were older now, and he, it was just that Philip was quite young. Philip loses first his mother and then his father, all before his ninth birthday. Philip's father ended up living this rather lavish, sort of playboy lifestyle in many ways, um, with a mistress moving to Monte Carlo. So quite a different kind of life from the one he'd had in Greece. Philip would see little of either his mother or his father for the rest of his childhood. Prince Philip, as a boy, seemed to take all this in his stride. He was a very cheerful, mischievous, practical joker. And it didn't seem as though he was especially affected by it. I talked to Prince Philip and he said, and I think this is very significant really, my mother was ill, my father was away, so I had to get on with it. And that really is what he's done all his life. Child psychologists would say that he built himself a sort of shell around himself where he could 
function as this outwardly cheerful person, but he didn't want to have people ask him about how he was feeling, and that would tend to bring out sort of irritation and, and anger um, from him. With his parents unable to take care of him, Philip's family now has to decide where the nine-year-old boy should go. Decisions that will shape the rest of his life. It's Paris in the summer of 1930. and age just nine, Philip is coping with distress and upheaval. His mother, Princess Alice, is committed to an asylum in Switzerland. And his father, Prince Andrea, is in Monte Carlo with his mistress. You have to think that these formative years for Philip must have had a profound effect on his character, and I think indeed they did. He must have been confused, I imagine, and, and probably hurting. He must have felt um, abandoned by his parents. The family decides that young Philip will live with Alice's brother in England. George, the Marquis of Milford Haven, or Georgie as he is known, is Philip's uncle. He is a Royal Navy commander and happily married to Nada, a former Russian aristocrat with two children of their own. They had this beautiful house in England, in Berkshire, and basically Philip went to live with them and he absolutely adored George, his uncle. Philip is warmly welcomed that he would experience. Prince Philip, I think, very much enjoyed both of their company. They were very sort of broad-minded. They had what was reputed to be the largest collection of, of pornography then existing. Um, they sent their son, age of 17, he was sent to a brothel in Paris to round off his education. They were sort of quite out there, but their marriage was very strong. Though there was infidelities that took place in that relationship, what he witnessed as a boy was the two people that Judy did love and were warm to him. Philip's whole family, though, play a role in his upbringing. I think he was much loved by the uncles, aunts, by his grandmother, and had bedrooms in several homes, but there would always be lots of planning on where would he go in the school holidays. So he must have felt a lot of his childhood in the 1930s like he was a parcel being moved from place to place in the holidays, from country to country. Some of those holidays are spent in southern Germany with his four elder sisters, who have all married German aristocrats. And it's Philip's second eldest sister, Theodora, who suggests a plan that would see Philip's life uprooted once again. When Prince Philip was living with the Milford Havens, some of his sisters were a little bit worried about their sort of bohemian ways. And, and Theodora, his second eldest sister, was married and his family had started a school called Salem. Salem was uh, a very different kind of school. And he was packed off there in his, his early teenage years, which he didn't really want to do. Philip arrives in Germany in the summer of 1933, with Hitler and his Nazi party now firmly in control. 19 Three, of course, is one of the most cataclysmic years in world history because it's the year that Hitler comes to power in Germany. So it seems a strange decision that that should be the year that Philip is sent for two or three terms to boarding school at Salem in Germany. The rise of Nazism was the backdrop for Philip's time spent at this school. And indeed, a branch of Hitler youth was established there. For him, it was a, a sort of rather bizarre and retrospectively interesting um, time. He saw an a lot of Nazi saluting, which um, always struck him as mildly hilarious. It reminded him of boys sort of asking permission to go to the lavatory. At 12, Philip is possibly too young to comprehend the events around him. But all four of his sisters and their German aristocrat husbands have allied themselves with the Nazi party. It's an astonishing thing that, that six years before Britain is at total war with Germany, there somebody who's later to marry says Elizabeth should have been at school in Nazi Germany. Alan. Philip's family decides that he should leave and finish his education back in Britain. He would say and has said in, in his adult life, home, where, where's home? I don't know where home is. He had many homes. Um, they, were, they were very welcoming, they looked after him, but he was essentially homeless. In this sense of Philip as really without a home, without a rudder, without a sense 
himself without a clear identity. I think that really marks Philip out in his early years. But Philip finds a spiritual home when it's agreed that he should go to Gordonston near the Highlands of Scotland. It's a progressive, newly established school run by Kurt Hahn, a German academic and friend of Philip's sister. Gordonston has always been described as a very sort of Spartan place, very sort of outward bound. But actually, it, it very much appealed to Prince Philip. He developed his leadership skills there. He was already quite independent, but he became, I think, more so when he was there. He did extremely well at the school. The school's ethos pushes the boys to be competitive, practical and self-reliant. And it pushes them hard. Gordonston was tough. It was exacting. It was very physical. It wasn't just an experience for the mind. It was also one for the body. It was about feeling things, cold showers, waking up early, being pushed to the physical limit. And I think there, Philip would have found a sort of distraction, perhaps from his emotional pain. Gordonston was, was a very, very unusual school in its time. It wasn't your typical British boarding school. It was no Eton or Winchester, but, but it very much was part of moulding Philip in the outdoorsy, direct person that he became. Philip embraces the Gordonston regime, but the trauma that has marked his life is set to return. It was while Philip was at Gordonston that there was a family tragedy which profoundly affected him, as it did the whole of the family. One of his sisters, Cecile, was coming with her husband and children over to the UK for a wedding. He was called into his headmaster's study to be told that his sister and her husband and her mother-in-law and her two boys had been killed in this plane crash. Prince Philip, on hearing the news, didn't break down. His sorrow was, was that of a man. But I think in Prince Philip's case, it was a sort of indication of how everything else in his life had hardened him in a way. Philip is 16 at the time of Cecile's death. He travels to the funerals at the height of Nazi Germany. Prince Philip, it must have been awful for him to have to know that he'd lost not only his sister, but his brother-in-law and his, his little nephews. The funeral was a sad affair, obviously, but a very strange affair, really, for him. The streets were so his sister's coffin and he, he was this sort of forlorn figure in a sort of black overcoat. And within a year of losing his sister and her family, Philip suffers another unexpected bereavement. Shortly after Cecile's death, his favourite uncle, George Milford Haven, died of bone cancer. That's a double tragedy, really, for, for Philip. And, you know, he had to move on again. Life was just sort of one awful event after another really, but, but he seemed to come through them all and he sort of managed to remain a sort of outwardly cheerful young person. Philip develops an effective coping strategy to deal with the difficulties he faces, the stiff upper lip. When he finished at Gordonston, Philip was a very confident and competent uh, young man, certainly on the outside. We'll never, I think, ever truly know what went and goes on inside Philip's head and his heart because he'd had to, with such a difficult upbringing, uh, have a very iron facade. But inside, he's always been, been quite sensitive. The void in Philip's life left by the death of his uncle is soon filled by George's younger brother, Lord Louis Mountbatten, who will become highly influential in the course of Philip's life. Lord Louis Mountbatten, the younger brother, really did take a lead in his life. Um, and uh, he was a great mentor. Mumbat was a real doer. He was somebody who had great ambition, great talent, great networking. One of the first bits of advice Philip takes from his uncle Dickie, as Mountbatten is known, is to follow him into the Royal Navy. After leaving Gordonston in 1939, of course, the outbreak of war, Philip enrolls in the Royal Navy College at Dartmouth. And it is a royal visit to the college that summer that would change the course of Philip's life completely. Prince Philip begins his training at Dartmouth's Royal Naval College in May 1939, four months before the outbreak of World War II. I think age 18, he's already a very, very self-sufficient man. These difficulties which have befallen him have, have toughened him up. 
He has the advantage of being devastatingly good looking. He's very, very blonde in those early pictures. And al already he's become a bit of a magnet for, 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 for young women. The young cadet's charms are on full display when the royal family visits the academy in July. His uncle, Dickie Mountbatten, arranges for Philip to entertain the princesses, Elizabeth and Margaret. They played a few games up over the nets and suggested they, they do the same. And by all accounts, uh, Elizabeth was smitten. She wrote to Philip to thank him for looking after her and Margaret. And then Philip wrote back. It was his cousin. She was a good contact to have. She was eventually going to be Queen of England. So Philip isn't a fool. So they started sending letters to each other. But Elizabeth is only 13 years old, too young for any serious romantic interest. Besides, Philip has other things on his mind. Less than six weeks after that fateful meeting, Britain declares war on Germany. We tried again and again to prevent this war. And for the sake of peace, we put up with a lot of things happening which ought not to have happened. Philip, of course, could have joined the, the Greek Navy. He was, he was still a prince of Greece and one of the heirs to the Greek throne. And I think increasingly in the late 1930s, Philip felt that he was English. He felt he was British. So it was the Royal Navy that he was going to be in at the beginning of the Second World War. In early 1940, Philip is sent to sea. At first to the Indian Ocean to escort convoys of soldiers. But the young midshipman is eager to be in the thick of the action. And by the following year, he gets his wish. He's transferred to a battleship in the Mediterranean to join the fight against the Italian Navy. There was one particular battle, the Battle of Matapan, which really saw the end of Italian involvement. The Italians took such a pasting. And Prince Philip was in charge of the searchlights during a night engagement. And two or three um, Italian ships were, were destroyed in, in quick succession with, with Prince Philip directing the searchlight so effectively that these Italian ships were, were well illuminated and, and, and promptly destroyed. 19-year-old Philip's skill with the searchlight earns him an official commendation, and he is honored with the Greek War Cross. Philip is proving to be a first-rate seaman, and by the age of 21, he has been promoted to first lieutenant, second in command of his ship, HMS Wallace. In July 1943, his leadership abilities are put to the test when the Wallace is targeted by German bombers. As soon as the sort of first round had, had, had finished and they went away, you know, Prince Philip knew that they would be back to finish him off. And he had to come up with something pretty quickly. And he prepared a raft with other officers and they lit um, burning torches, flares at the end of the raft with, with smoke coming out and they, they set the raft off and sailed very, very quickly, completely dark in the other direction. When the German planes returned, thankfully, instead of bombing lives on his ship, by his very, very swift action. As he rises through the naval ranks, Philip's also growing closer to Princess Elizabeth. He did find time frequently to, to write to Elizabeth, and there was an occasion or two during the war when he had leave that he would go and stay um, at Windsor Castle. Philip spends Christmas of 1943 with the royal family. It's soon clear the 17-year-old princess is falling for the 22-year-old naval officer. She was excited by him. He was very different from the, the very proper prim aristocrats that her mother would want her to be associated with. He was a bit of a rebel, and she felt that he was a bit of a catch. She fell desperately in love with him. She thought he was marvellous. He was a war hero, he was good-looking, he was kind, he, just everything she'd ever wanted. But Philip isn't so sure Elizabeth is right for him. After all, marrying the future queen would mean committing to a lifetime of public duty. But whispers about Philip and Elizabeth are beginning to spread, helped by his uncle Mountbatten. By the time Philip returns from his war service in early 1946, he seems to have made up his mind. I think if you're sixth in line to the Greek throne, if you've only got about um, £600 in the bank, if, if you haven't got a settled home of your own, the chance of marrying the very attractive, intelligent, bright, sparky heir to, to the most prestigious 
monarchy in the world. I do think that's a terrible opportunity. I think he only started to fall in love with Elizabeth about 1946, when the king started to warm to him and he was invited to more and more family events. He began to see the advantages of what was in front of him, but also the genuine affection would then develop with Elizabeth. Winning Elizabeth's heart proves relatively easy, but winning over her parents and their courtiers is a different matter. When no one realised that Prince Philip was a serious prospect for Princess Elizabeth, there really was panic in the British establishment. He was not at all the type they expected, and there's a lot of distrust of him in the royal household, in the royal family, in the government. Philip is seen as an outsider, someone who didn't go to the right schools, doesn't have any money, and is far too outspoken to be a true British gentleman. Philip was from a foreign royal family. He had been brought up in sort of military ways. He was really penniless in terms of his upbringing. He'd lived this kind of nomadic childhood. He had a very unstable, dysfunctional family, and certainly some courtiers thought that he really wasn't appropriate for a royal. I suppose they viewed him as a little rough and ready, maybe brusque, maybe overconfident. Certainly uh, views were expressed that uh, he might not be the right person. Nobody approved of him at all, but Elizabeth, for the first time in her life, she really, really stuck her heels in. This was the man she wanted and no other would do. To become a more suitable candidate for the princess's hand, Philip makes some dramatic changes. With the help and guidance of um, Dickie Mountbatten, his uncle, he decided, or each was decided for him, perhaps, that he should take on British nationality. And so he gave up his right to the Greek throne, he gave up his Greek nationality, he was no longer Philip of Greece, and he became British and he became Philip Mountbatten. And he also had to give up the religion he'd been baptised into. He was no longer Greek Orthodox. He now had to be Anglican. So they really do everything to change Philip into the English man they wish he was. I think those quite significant sacrifices was the beginning of a whole series of sacrifices that would then mark out Philip in relation to Elizabeth. He was always going to have to try to conform to be acceptable by the summer of 1947, Philip and Elizabeth have finally won the king and queen's blessing. In these, the first special studies of the pair since the news of their engagement, it's easy to see the radiant happiness of the princess as she and her very good-looking husband-to-be pose for the cameras in the palace. Philip marries Elizabeth on November the 20th, 1947, at Westminster Abbey. The wedding day of Philip and Elizabeth couldn't have been grander, couldn't have been more spectacular. People got very, very involved with it and very excited by it. And the, the crowds were absolutely huge. Everything about the wedding is reinventing Philip. He's a great war hero. He's practically British. And now he's the marvellous future consort of the marvellous future queen. But for all the joy of the wedding day, there's a bitter pill for Philip to swallow. His mother is the only member of his immediate family by his side. His father, Prince Andrea, had died during the war, after not seeing his son for many years. And his sisters are not invited. It was deemed that his sisters who'd married Germans should not come over. It was too soon after the war. And so that was um, a source of, of great uh, disappointment for him. But life as the new Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh is good for Philip and Elizabeth. You have to remember that he, he had been essentially homeless. He had not had a family life since he was, he did. Elizabeth it meant the world to him and he was incredibly open about it. Their family grows quickly with the birth of Prince Charles in 1948 and Princess Anne two years later. Philip put behind him a lot of the difficulties of his childhood and I think he himself was, was liberated by forming a happy family. For the first time since his early childhood, Philip has a home of his own, Clarence House in London. And despite taking on some royal duties alongside his wife, he remains on active duty in the Navy. One of the happiest times in the young couple's life was when uh, Prince Philip was posted to Malta. Um, he was out there for quite some time, several months, and Elizabeth went out and stayed with him on two occasions, quite protracted stays. And this was a very, uh, almost normal 
assistance uh, for her, and she absolutely loved it. They had wonderful times that they would go to dances, they would drive often without bodyguards. I think there were very, very happy times for Philip and Elizabeth between 1947 and 1952. I really think that Philip and Elizabeth imagine that their life post-marriage is going to be their life for the next 20 years or so, that they'll live in Clarence's house, he will do royal duties, he will support her, they will have their children, but it isn't going to be the big job. It's not queen and consort. I think both she and Philip imagine that'll be a job they're doing when they're in their 40s, going into their 50s. There's no way, I think, that they have any idea how close it is around the corner. But in 1951, King George VI becomes ill with what is later revealed to be lung cancer. It falls to Elizabeth and Philip to take on more royal duties in his place, including a tour of the Commonwealth nations in early 1952. They were going to be away for um, several months. So they set off for Kenya, hoping that when they came back, uh, the king would, would be OK. Uh, but it was not to be. Just days after their departure, on February the 6th, King George dies in his sleep. A royal aide breaks the news to Philip. Philip, he just looked absolutely ashen-faced because I think he realised his entire life at that moment was going to change. I think he went into shock and, and he put a, co a newspaper over his head and just absorbed the, this terrible news. Then he went to tell his wife. Philip has to break the news to his wife that her beloved father is gone and also that everything has changed overnight. She is now the queen, he is now the consort, and the life they had... How much will he be forced to sacrifice? And how will he use his turbulent childhood experiences to guide him in his new role? As the new Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh land in England from Kenya, following the death of George VI, they have to confront the reality of their new lives. Their entire life changed. When they arrived on the tarmac at London Airport, Elizabeth came down the steps first, and Philip hung back. And then, of course, the realisation that the rest of his life, he was going to be two steps behind his wife, must have really hit him. The first step Philip must take is to sacrifice his day job. As consort, Philip has to give up his naval career, which is quite difficult. It's something he fought for for so long, and he's not allowed to keep his job. He was about to be promoted to commander. He was going to be in charge of a big ship. So all of that had to be shown. It was very difficult for Philip to accept this role of second in command when he'd used to being in command. Philip, though, is bucking the trend. In post-war Britain, most men have the expectation of being master of their own households. For Prince Philip, that expectation is turned on its head. Philip becomes consort in the midst of the 1950s, at a time when patriarchy and hierarchy absolutely rules. Women are at home as housewives. And here is Philip effectively being thrown into the position of the, you know, the country's ultimate house husband. Philip now has to work out what he is going to do. There is no job description with the role of consort to a queen. Albert was the last, nearly 100 years earlier, to Victoria. He has to find a role for himself. He has to find an identity as consort. It's not prescribed. The queen, of course, received government business in those royal boxes, which he was never privy to. The queen was having audiences with her first prime minister, Winston Churchill. He was excluded from them. What was to be his purpose? It was the beginning of a very, very difficult period in his life. Philip sees himself as a modernising force, but is frustrated by resistance from powerful figures within the palace. Philip finds his role of consort as being squashed by his mother-in-law because Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, wants to stay in Buckingham Palace, have a role of influence over her daughter. And what you start to see happening during the early reign of Queen Elizabeth, is that there really becomes this battle 
Queen Mother, who wants everything to stay exactly the same. And there are further attempts to marginalize Philip by some of the old guard serving the monarchy. The courtiers were brutal to him. They looked down their noses at him. They didn't give him any attention. The courtiers weren't really interested in him. They didn't really have a lot of time for this upstart, this usurper, as they used to regard him. Philip, of course, is a man who's come fresh from conflict. The Navy is in his blood. He needs adrenaline. He needs a purpose. He needs to be doing things. But Philip turns an early setback into a personal mission. As newlyweds, Princess Elizabeth and Philip were living happily in Clarence House, where Philip had overseen the wholesale modernization. Philip really throws himself into creating Clarence House as a home for this young family. And that, I think, really reflects the fact they never had a home before. So they had all the mod cons, and Philip loved mod cons, and they had washing machines. They had all the latest gadgetry, which Philip loved. But as monarch, Elizabeth is expected to move into Buckingham Palace, which is a personal blow for Philip. No one likes living in Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace is really a big office, and no one ever seems to like living in there, and they were no exception. It, it lacked the intimacy they'd been used to, and his wife was no longer his wife. She was now really married to the country. She was always surrounded by advisors, by courtiers, people who wanted him out of the way. Philip, though, launches himself into revolutionising how things are done at the palace. He was a proud, successful man without a real role. This was a real dilemma for him. Um, but he threw himself into the there. He went around Buckingham Palace, literally room by room, looking at what needed to be modernised, how communication around the palace could be improved. So he began to question the way things were being done. Of course, that didn't go down at all well, where things were done year after year, decade after decade, because that's the way tradition would have it. But he wanted to shake all that up. And so he made himself incredibly unpopular with an awful lot of the grey men, if you like, at the palace. Undaunted by the forces opposing him, Philip persists with his determination for a greater role. He wanted to do more and he wanted to have an influence and the Queen knew that and she put him, for example, in charge of the Coronation Commission to oversee the arrangements for the Coronation. And here we see for the first time Philip being something of a maverick, perhaps because of his status as being an outsider, having a different kind of perspective. Philip feels very strongly that the Coronation it should be more modern, that should be open, that, it, it, that the BBC's request televise it should be admitted and there are traditionalists who disagree with this they think it could undermine the majesty of royalty but philip sees the advantages of harnessing the new medium of television he for example knew that the coronation was going to be a critical event saw the opportunity of making the coronation this global event like none other letting the television cameras into the abbey for the first time and against the reservation the government and Winston Churchill, Philip really pushed that through. Philip is always battling to have his ideas taken seriously, always having to fight, because lots of people will say to Elizabeth, was that Philip's idea? Well, no, because they really exclude him and ignore him. For almost two days and nights, the crowds have been assembling in sunshine and rain for the moment when the young queen, radiant in her exquisite gown, left the palace for Westminster Abbey. The coronation takes place on June the 2nd, 1953, with television cameras capturing every moment. More than 20 million people in Britain tuned in to watch the ceremony. And eight years after the war, another victory. Philip's sisters are allowed to attend, and so does his mother, Princess Alice, who is now living as a nun in Athens. Philip had always been very, very fond of his mother, and I think he was really happy that his mother should be there. But she came in her grey nun's habit, so she, she, she was very obvious. It was a great moment for Philip and, and his relations. But the success of the coronation, both on the world stage and for Philip personally, comes off the back of a body blow for the man in the support role. I suppose Philip had to swallow an awful lot as a proud male and a royal male. But one thing that really grated with him was the fact... After their marriage, the couple were known as the Edinburghs. But once Elizabeth ascended the throne, the plan is that she will be part of the House of Windsor. 
He expected, absolutely expected, that Elizabeth would take his name on marriage and that the children would take his name. So therefore, it would be the house of Mountbatten. Philip's assumption that the family will adopt his surname is political dynamite. Various people, most importantly Churchill, were dead set against this idea and were determined that the name should remain Windsor. There was a big row about it, uh, but Philip lost the argument and the Queen agreed that her children, Charles and Anne, would be part of the House of Windsor. But during the row, he said, he, you know, what kind of man am I? I'm just a bloody amoeba, he said. So it was very, very hurtful to him. I think he really felt that if he gave up his title, his religion, his name, his nationality, then the actual reward would be that he got to be Philip, the House of Mountbatten. And not as that really made him feel very excluded, very humiliated, and it was a very difficult moment for him. Philip has a tried and tested way of dealing with the strains of royalty. I think having had the upbringing he experienced, he just adopted that same attitude to royal life. This is what I've married into. This is the hand I've been dealt. We'll just get on with it. Um, and that's what he did. It wasn't always easy. There were rifts in the marriage. There were rocky periods. There were times when he felt he just had to get away and did get away. Philip focuses his energies on where he believes he can make a difference. Inspired by his own education and achievements at Gordonston, Philip establishes the Duke of Edinburgh Reward Scheme in 1956. The life of modern youth isn't all pop music, long hair and punch-ups. He recently presented gold awards to 127 girls and over 750 boys. He wanted to empower youth. He wanted them to meet the challenges that were facing them. Not in a pampered way, but in a way to try to engage them in society. But Philip finds that he still has his detractors wanting to curb his ambitions. The politician actually says to him, this sounds rather like the Hitler Youth. And what a thing to say. It really brings home the anti-German xenophobia there was in Britain at the time. And the fact was that Philip, who'd fought so bravely on the side of the Allies, and that, I think, really reflects how often Philip was blocked openly and subtly and was constantly subject to these people saying, no, no, stay in that corner, just smile and wave. With his modernizer's head on, faking tours of inspection, his thoroughness was often inclined to startle. But now we're used to his rather specialized approach, and we see him here showing his particular interest in industry. Prince Philip was always, from a very young age, fascinated by science and technology. His uncle Georgie also loved to make things, and Philip, as a young boy, would be so happy to go into the workshop and, and see him uh, making model steam engines, um, designing all, all sorts of things. I think this is where Philip's love of design came, actually. He's literally toured the country at different points, visiting factories, speaking up about British engineering, British science. Ladies and gentlemen, it is clearly our duty as citizens to see that science is used for the benefit of mankind. Prince Philip had this great enthusiasm. It came from the heart, sort of spokesman, on behalf of British scientists and, and British industry, and, and became a very effective advocate for industries in the period after the Second World War. By the late 1950s, Philip has cemented his position in the monarchy, bolstered by being made a Prince of the United Kingdom by the Queen in 1957. But after a childhood and a difficult move into the royal household as a young man. How will these challenging times shape Philip in the long years ahead? It's August 2017 and Prince Philip takes one final salute before retiring at the age of 96. In his 70 years by the Queen's side, he has carved out a unique role as her most loyal lieutenant and champion of hundreds of his own charities and causes. He's travelled enormously, 22,000 engagements, 800 charities that he's been involved with, and any charity that Philip has been involved with has said, yes, this man made an enormous difference. His early struggles are now a distant memory, but Philip's work as consort has undoubtedly been shaped 
by those tumultuous years. I think that having such a troubled childhood really made Philip the man that he is. I think it, it's given the backbone to him to put up with anything. And, and that has been his philosophy through his life. Don't moan about it, just get on with it. And that's what he's done. He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. Philip's experience weathering the storms of his childhood has stood him in good stead throughout his royal career. Never more so than in the 1990s, when the royal family was rocked by a series of crises. Philip tries to help. He writes to Diana saying that he understands what it's like to be outside of the royal family, to be seen as an outsider. The sort of things that he wrote to her about were the difficulties that he had had when he had joined the family, the pressures that he'd been under, how he understood the pressures that she would feel. Philip's intervention was not enough to save the marriage. Charles and Diana were officially separated in 1992, a year so bad for the royal family that the Queen called it horrific, although she said it in Latin. It has turned out to be an annus horribilis. But worse was to come in 1997, when Princess Diana was killed in a car accident in Paris. Her young sons were staying at Balmoral with Prince Philip and the Queen when they received the terrible news. There was probably no one better qualified or better placed to help William and Harry after the death of their mother than their grandfather, Philip. Um, we have to remember that uh, he had essentially lost his mother when he was just coming up to nine when she was committed to a sanatorium. His father also virtually abandoned him. So he was very empathetic, obviously, towards his grandsons, William and Harry. Another tragedy from Philip's childhood may have been on his mind when it came to advising the boys about the funeral procession. Prince William and Prince Harry weren't terribly keen on the idea of walking in the procession. Prince Philip took the long view and he said, I think when you're older that you would very much regret not walking behind your mother's coffin. Philip had done it himself behind his own sister's coffin, age 16, walked behind Cecile's coffin, devastated, full of pain. It's a very sweet moment when Prince Philip puts his arm around William as they go under Admiralty Arch. I know people, when you look back, think it was something too much for Prince Harry to do, and he himself has reflected upon that. I suspect as he gets older, he'll be pleased that he did it and that he listened to the wise counsel of his grandfather, somebody who I think has experienced great tragedy in his life. The dark days of the 1990s hurt the royal family's standing with the British public. Prince Philip plays an important role in helping restore the family's popularity in the 21st century, perhaps motivated by his own experience of how quickly a nation can turn against its monarchy. His family were thrown off the Greek throne and he had to flee in a packing box. So I think that he was always conscious of that and always conscious that even though the British monarchy seemed so stable, that it could be knocked off its perch. Philip came from the European royal. They, they were having their, their, their kingdoms taken away. And he, he felt very much that the, the British royal family must stick together. They must all work together for the common aim, which is the, the good of the monarchy. In 2020, the royal family is facing new challenges, not least the departure of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex have announced they intend to back as uh, senior members of the royal family. I think we all know from recent history that becoming part of the British royal family is not easy. Uh, Diana bailed out, uh, Fergie bailed out, Harry and Meghan have both left royal duties. It's not easy, but I think Philip really made the best of it. On the occasion of their golden wedding anniversary, Philip gives an insight into one of his guiding principles the main lesson that we've learned is that tolerance is the one essential ingredient of any happy marriage. It may not be quite so important when things are going well, but it is absolutely vital when things get difficult. Prince Philip's life has never been smooth sailing. Beginning with exile and abandonment, through his wartime heroics and early battles with the royal establishment, to the tempestuous years of the 1990s. But it's these storms that have given him the resilience and the strength to 
succeed in his role, guiding his family, supporting the Queen, and serving the country for more than 70 years.